The Decline of the West, Volume 2, Perspectives of World History by Oswald Spengler. So with this book, I have now read both volumes of The Decline of the West. And I did it in a pretty fast amount of time. I think it took me about two weeks for each of these books to get through. So um, about a month in total to read the whole thing. And that's kind of a feat, I think, because um, that's about over 900 odd um, copy paper sized uh, pages. Now, but I say that not so much to toot my own horn, but um, rather as a testament to how engaging I found these books to be because I really did. I found The Decline of the West to be one of the most fascinating things that I've read uh, in quite some time, if not ever. And I was really kind of... Um, you know, just enthralled reading these books. Um, now, I don't really anticipate this video being quite as long as my review of Volume 1 was because this volume, uh, the second one, is kind of more just an extension of the first volume, I think. Uh, like, Form and Actuality Volume 1 was creating the theory of history that Spengler created. Um, you know, outlining the terminology, the underlying thought behind it all. Uh, but this volume, Perspectives of World History, um, is kind of explicating it a little further, elucidating some things more, but also kind of applying it to more historical examples, I think. Uh, so, um, I, like I said, I think this video will probably be a little quicker than the last one because I don't feel like I have to explain so much. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, The Decline of the West, Volume 2, Perspectives of World History. Where do we pick up after um, uh, the first volume? Uh, well, in the beginning pages of this book, uh, early on in this book, um, Spangler sets out to um, rebut Darwin. In Volume 1, he had set out to rebut Kant in a lot of ways, I think, um, and I don't know if he was successful in that endeavor because, again, there were some passages in that book where it was just the most abstruse blathering I have ever read. I had no clue what he was saying about time or space or what have you. Um, I was kind of lost there. So I don't know whether he, you know, successfully refuted uh, Kant, but I don't think he successfully refuted Darwin. And I want to say that because Spengler... Um, really comes across in these books as something of like a polymath, like a really intelligent guy, and he definitely was, but um, I don't think he was an expert in every area because um, he attempts to um, refute the theory of evolution, I think, in the beginning pages of this book, uh, and I don't think he was successful in that because the arguments that he gives sound very similar to, like, the arguments that you hear from, like, young earth creationists, like, where are the transitional fossils, and there is not enough time for this or that to happen. Um, so, yeah, uh, Spangler's smart, but again, he's he's not, I don't think, an expert in everything, so that uh, aspect of this book has not held up uh, terribly well, I would say, in retrospect, but uh, from there, um, Spangler talks a lot in this volume about Magian culture, and in Volume 1 he mentioned this um, a, a little bit, but Volume 1 was primarily uh, concerned with Apollinian culture, which is like classical ancient Greek culture, and Faustian culture, which is our modern Western culture. And um, But in this volume he uh, talks a lot about what he calls Magian culture, which is like Middle Eastern, Arabic, Judeo, early Christian culture. Um, and he talks a lot about their underlying unspoken metaphysical driving idea behind their culture, which he uh, denotes as the world as cave, the world as cavern. And again, here we get into some more highly speculative architectural um, uh, 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 readings where he says he would have us believe that that's why mosques have like those domed roofs, those kind of cavernous vaults. Um, they're built like that because deep down the Arabic Middle Eastern people view the world as being like a 
cave, a cavern of some sort. I don't know. Um, once again, I want to reiterate, as I did in Volume 1, that this is highly speculative and also basically unfalsifiable. Uh, but from there, he goes into some um, hermeneutics, uh, some exegetics of Scripture, uh, kind of the Quran, but primarily, I think, more the Bible the, the, and the divide that kind of exists between the Old Testament and the New. Um, he goes through, like, the Gospels, and he pulls out some things. And this, I want to say right now, is one of the most riveting things that I have ever read in my life. It's probably the most riveting non-fictional thing that I've ever read was the, the sequence in this book where Spangler... Um, um, it kind of delves off into scriptural and biblical criticism and, again, kind of hermeneutics and biblical exegetics. I have to say, that blew my mind. That really did. That was one of the most fascinating things I have ever read. Um, he makes some very, very interesting points in that, um, and that's kind of just in the overview of the, the Meiji and Culture. I'm just throwing that out there because it really, it really stuck with me. It really struck me when I was reading it. That was just incredibly fascinating. Uh, but then he also talks some about Russia in this, and he had talked um, about Russia some in the preceding book, I think. But um, in this book, he says that Russia is not part of the Faustian Western world, and it's not part of the Meiji and kind of or Chinese, kind of, you know, more Eastern world. Uh, rather, he says that Russia is something new, something unto itself, but that it hasn't really come into its own yet, that, that true Russian culture is kind of bubbling under the surface, that it's kind of, it's, it's waiting, it hasn't really blossomed into its own, um, uh, into its own uh, springtime yet, that it's still kind of waiting. Uh, and, he, and he goes through... Uh, kind of some Russian history and also some Russian literary criticism, which I found, uh, once again, highly fascinating. Um, but he talks about, like, Peter the Great, uh, right, because, like, and he says that Peter the Great tried to westernize Russia. He tried to bring Western influence, Faustian influence into Russia, and that's why he says St. Petersburg, the city, is, like, very distinct in Russia in their, in their, um, geography, that it's very, very distinct, and that Russians, deep down on a spiritual level, kind of revolt from that. He even quotes, like a, a quote from Dostoevsky, talking about the city of Petersburg, saying, like, there's something wrong with this city, it's not right, it's, it's there's just something off about it that the Russian people can't pinpoint themselves, but it's because it's kind of a bastardization of their own, um, simmering culture with elements of an alien culture that was kind of forced onto it. Uh, and that was really interesting. Uh, and he says that like the Russian unspoken metaphysical driving cultural idea is um, the symbol of a horizontal plane. Um, yeah, that's, and he, again, he gives some kind of architectural social kind of verification to back this up, or purportedly at least, but he says that Russia is founded upon the concept of like a flat horizontal plane. Um, but it was his literary criticism from Russia that I found the most um, intriguing, and which really put into, some, and put into words some sentiments that I've had, because he um, contrasts uh, the characters in the literary output of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. And he uh, posits that Dostoevsky is the true Russian, and Tolstoy is the Peter the Great kind of Russian, the 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 bastardized pseudo Westerner Russian who is kind of out of touch with his own um, simmering culture. And I think he might be right because what he talks about in here is that like Bolshevism, like you know the implementation of Marxism. Um, which led to um, the revolution, which was very recent at the time that these books were written. Um, uh, Spengler asserts that that was yet another attempt at westernization to Russia, um, and that this is not really in line with Russia's like true character, which hasn't really manifested itself yet. 
so Spangler says. Uh, but he says that Tolstoy is right in line with the Bolshevism that came after him. Um, and I agree with this because he he uses the, the literary output of both Tolstoy and Dostoevsky to illustrate their inner character. Um, and this explains, like, like I said, this puts into words why I don't like Tolstoy so much, but why I do like Dostoevsky so much, because um, Tolstoy was a preacher. He was. He was a reformer. He was an activist. He had lots of theories about how other people should live their lives, just like the Bolshevists did. Um, he was very, now granted, he was coming from a more religious standpoint, but still he he had ideas, dang it, and he wanted other people to abide by them. Um, and so in that, um, Spengler says that Tolstoy, Tolstoy is at heart the bastardized pseudo-Western Russian um, who has kind of forsaken their own uh, nascent uh, culture. But uh, Spengler contrasts this with Dostoevsky because Dostoevsky is the exact opposite of Tolstoy in that he is not a reformer. He is not a pamphleteer. He's not trying to foist anything on you. All of Dostoevsky's books are concerned not with propounding and um, trying to uh, represent and trying to sell any kind of ideology, but rather trying to get people to back away from it. Dostoevsky saw, you know, where Russia was going, especially with his book, Demons, which I actually read and reviewed earlier this year. You can check that out. Uh, but Demons, Notes from Underground, these books aren't concerned. He's not trying to sell you an ideology and trying to get you to go in any one direction. Rather, he's trying to pull you back. He's trying to say, just let go. Just, you know, remember classical, like, Christian values and don't fall for all this, you know, godless gobbledygook. Um, and and uh, Spengler says that Dostoevsky is basically like a Russian saint. In fact, um, I didn't, I was not aware of this, but Spengler says that prior to his death, uh, Dostoevsky was actually planning on writing um, his own uh, life of Christ, um, his own kind of uh, gospel, if you will. And Spengler says that had he done this, had he lived to see that accomplished, that that book would have been truly a gospel for the Russian people that is every bit as valid as Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Um, I didn't know that that was interesting to me, but I really liked what Spengler had to say there about that. I think he was pretty dead on uh, with that uh, dissection there. Uh, but anyway, from there, Spengler goes on to talk about the rise of the megalopolis and how this is the true uh, hallmark of a culture that is turning into a civilization. And what he means by megalopolis is a world city, as he calls it, a big-ass, densely populated city like London or New York uh, that is very, very urban and has a mentality that is very, very distinct from uh, the uh, more rural peasantry or the, the, the kind of landed gentry of the countryside. Um, and it is with the rise of these big urban um, conglomerations that Spengler says the, the civilization stage really kicks in uh, because um, the mentality of the people who live in these places is very, very distinct from people who live in more rural areas. And I can attest to that from firsthand experience. I live in you know Arkansas, one of the most rural states in the Union. Um, and you will not get the stuff out here that you will get in New York or Chicago or L.A., the kind of postmodern, reform-based, more socialistic kind of um, uh, active kind of people, ideology trying to, like, steer society in any one direction. You don't get that so much out here. And Spengler says that this is because um, the peasantry or even the, the landed nobility, like the, the feudal lords of like the Middle Ages, they're fundamentally tied to the land. They are kind of plant-like. They, they make their living from the land, um, and they're very, very attuned to their environment, whereas the urban uh, uh, character is detached from the land. They're, they're very out of touch with things, and because of that, they're 
ideas their minds are allowed to kind of run away with them because they're untethered from any kind of practical you know reality in other words and i think this is demonstrable i think spengler's right here like rousseau marx these people were not these people were not good old country boys you know they were they were urban uh characters city dwellers largely who had you know their ideas for how things should be but their mentalities were very distinct from people that live you know in more rural areas that would that their such ideas would never have crossed their mind right uh, but also with the coming of the megalopolis uh spengler says the uh the the economy changes and and of course this this absolutely is true uh, like in the middle ages and stuff medieval times you have like uh feudalism but you have like it's like an agrarian kind of it's it's an economy that's very tied to the land it's tied to not money so much and this spengler makes a big deal of in the final pages toward there towards the end of this book um what money does to a civilization uh because prior to money being the main you know goal the main concept that's on everybody's mind the, the economy was more geared around the land and estates that like that like um you know the like the nobility like a fortune the concept of fortune in olden times was tied to how much land you own how much cattle you own how many horses you own or even it, how many slaves or serfs you own right uh, but not so with the coming of the megalopolis and more industrialized uh, modes of economy where money like just you know paper and coins becomes the the, the it truly becomes the almighty dollar right uh, and that this changes things, and this changes things in a major way, and Spengler goes into a lot of depth about uh, the shifting modes of governance to, like, democracy and stuff, which will eventually become progressively more and more corrupt as people learn that they can buy politicians with the money, correct? Um, and stuff like that, but then also you have the rise of, like, industrial capitalism, but then from that, pushing back against that, you have then uh, more socialistic theories, as with Rousseau, as with Marx, that are trying to, like, control things and stuff, and that this will lead to conflict between these various ideologies, but eventually what will emerge victorious out of all of this is blood, that people will revert, kind of, eventually revert back to a kind of racial although i don't think that word means exactly what it means when most other people use it when spangler uses it in here um and people will revert back to kind of a racial identity that is that is will kind of trump money and these various ideologies with the coming of caesarism and this is what spangler alluded to this in the previous volume but he goes into more depth with it here that the ultimate fate of any civilization is Caesarism. It starts out as a culture, it has a, a youth, a springtime, then it turns into a civilization in its maturity, and then from there it um, declines into senescence. Uh, but that the ultimate fate of any civilization that has sprung from any culture is Caesarism, and that with this, um, as well as with the blood racial kind of um, atavism, of the populace will trump business will trump money um because it will eventually become like a dictatorship right i mean you know the uh, as spengler said in the first volume of the decline of the west uh rome was the civilization uh to the greek culture and rome had a republic for a while but then that eventually collapsed into literal caesar and that's where the term caesar even comes from is Rome, and that from there to Rome's ultimate collapse, uh, it was ruled in you know basically a dictatorship. And the, and the Spengler says this is this is unavoidably the fate of everything, and it will be the the unavoid the unavoidable fate of Faustian Western uh, civilization as well. And in the book, in the previous one, or yeah, I think it was in the previous one, but he that he alluded to like the year two thousand. That he predicted that around the year 2000 um, things would really start to drop off and we would start to see 
an expanse of executive power governmentally um, and kind of the erosion of more liberal, classically liberal uh, notions in favor of an increasing authoritarianism. And yeah, this is, an, <laughs> this is another aspect where I have to say, even though these books are unfalsifiable, and they may not hold up under the most rigorous of scientific criteria. I still think he may have been on to something because if things aren't becoming more authoritarian, if things haven't become more authoritarian since about 2000, um, if, if we aren't heading for, you know, a true dictatorship, you could have fooled me <laughs> because it really does seem as though we're, we're going down that road um, uh, just as fast as you please. Uh, but the thing about these books is that Spengler says this is just unavoidable, that this is just the fate. Of, and he uses the word destiny, like implicit in the ideas that he says underlies every culture. There is a destiny that these, as I said in the in my review of the previous volume, that these ideas can only go so far, they can only do so much, and that the ultimate destiny of everything, of every culture and every later civilization is Caesarism, that uh, Caesarism, dictatorship, I'll say, will come in um, and destroy money, destroy, like, well, maybe not destroy business and economy, but it will trump these things and supplant itself, as well as, like, like I said, the kind of racial blood atavistic, like, revolt of the populace away from these um kind of more economic, socio-political ideologies in favor of something that's much more based around classical notions of power and dominance rather than kind of hidden behind the scenes um, politicking and corruption and such. And another thing that Spengler mentions happens as a culture matures into a civilization um, with like the coming of the megalopolis and such is a decline in population, a decline in birth rate. And this, I think, is really analogous to the lifespan of like an individual person because Spengler's entire thesis is that the life cycles of cultures and civilizations are likenable to the life cycle of an organism. And with people outright um, you, when you're in childhood, when you're a kid, things are imaginative. Things are pretty rosy. You're generally pretty, you know, lively and optimistic. But as you grow up and you mature, uh, things lose their luster and you start relying more on reason and rationale and like weighing consequences and such. Um, and this, I think, is what Spengler says happens with um, whenever cultures truly go in all in on the civilization stage and they're deep in it, um, birth rates decline because now the world is a problem. It, it's not spontaneous anymore. And he mentioned this in volume one with like Schopenhauer, that with Schopenhauer's work, uh, life itself became a problem. Um, it, it's, 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 it's not spontaneous anymore and people don't just have kids um, they think about it, they plan, and in many cases, they opt not to procreate, um, and this obviously leads to a populational decline, but Spengler says this is just what happens as, as civilization, as a culture grows into a civilization, as people, as a people, grow up. I mean, that's just, it's just a process of maturing that the, 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 the happy-go-lucky days of childhood are over and now we're deep into cynical adulthood where things are much more managed by uh, pro and con, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, that is pretty much the, that's pretty much it. And in, in this book literally ends with Spengler saying, it's going to happen with or without you. It's just, it's literally just destiny, right? So I don't know what that says about free will. Um, I, that kind of stays in the back of my mind saying, when I'm reading these books, what does all this have to say about uh, the concept of individual free will? Um, yeah, I'll think on that, will you? But that's pretty much The Decline of the West, Volume 2, Perspectives of World History. That's what Spengler has to say in this, the second and final volume of his work. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I enjoyed this volume more 
than the first volume because there was much less of that abstruse blathering than than there was in the first volume. Like in that first volume when he was dealing with all the the Kantian stuff and he was talking about time negating space or whatever it is he says. And, you know, that I was lost. I was like, I don't know what you're saying. I, you know, I struggled to understand what Kant was saying in his book. And then Spangler comes along and says, tries to do his own thing. I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. This is a little bit too um, highfalutin. Uh, but it, there's much less of that in this one. This is much more brass tacks kind of getting down to the nitty gritty of history and where it's all leading, right? And I enjoyed this much more. And again, that entire sequence in this, which is pretty extensive, where he uh, engages in the script role for hermeneutics and biblical exegetics and what have you, uh, that was truly one of the most fascinating things I've ever read. That really, that'll really stay with you if you, you know, interested in that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, as with volume one, I'm not going to rate this with a letter rating because uh, with these more kind of philosophical books, I think it, that would depend on how right they end up being. Um, and while I do think that Spengler uh, may have been onto something at the very least, uh, or he may be, you know, more or less correct, at, you know, otherwise at most, but um uh, it, it's still unfalsifiable and it's still so very speculative that I don't, I'm not going to say that like, this is gospel. He, he hit the nail on the head. This is like the most accurate prophetic work ever written. I'm not going to say that because again, it, you can go, you can argue this so much because again, so much of this is like reading into things in ways that most people probably wouldn't. And again, it could be right. It could be wrong. There's just not, it's, it's unfalsifiable really. So I'm not going to give this a letter uh, grade, but I am going to say as with the first volume, this was truly one of the most fascinating things I've ever read in my life. It's one of the, probably one of the best non-fictional reading experiences I've ever had. It, it really hooked me because um, it's it's so unique. Uh, Spengler's perspective in this is just it's just unique. He he was really kind of blazing a trail with this, and you know even if it's debatable, even if he may not be you know quote unquote right, um, I think these books are still immensely valuable because they make you think about things and they make you look at things differently than you probably have. And I think there is a, a world of value in these books. And of course, they're, the writing in these books is just fantastic. Uh, and also, I, I undertook to read these books in the first place because of uh, Cormac McCarthy's uh, mention of them in his work and also the, the kind of veiled potential endorsement of it uh, by him. And I can see so much of his work in these books. There is some stuff in this second volume that Spangler says about war that literally sounds like it was ripped, that Blood Meridian <laughs> ripped right from this, that Cormac McCarthy ripped right out of this when he was writing Blood Meridian about how war is the father of all industry and all creation and stuff. He, I mean, it was literally just like a one-to-one -one kind of thing. Uh, so I can definitely see Spengler's influence on McCarthy now, uh, having read these books. But yeah, uh, The Decline of the West, Volume 2, Perspectives of World History by Oswald Spengler are really just the decline of the West, the whole shebang now. I've read it. Um, have you read it? If you have, let me know down in the comments what you thought about it, whether you have agreed or disagreed with anything I've said today. Uh, if you haven't read it, I could recommend this, but know what you're getting into. It's very contestable, um, and it can be kind of um, uh, confrontational. I mean, it can be kind of controversial, I suppose. Um, and also, um, uh, it, it's it's just, it's kind of just a mammoth undertaking, because these this is a big book. It's, it's thick. This one's longer than volume one, um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an investment, but I, I found it rewarding. So yeah, I could probably possibly recommend it. So, um, as long as you know what you're getting into. And as always, uh, if you've enjoyed anything you've seen or heard here today, remember to hit that like button and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. And until next time, peace.